the last session. So if you're not in your seat, just make your way there. That's fine. Um, I'm absolutely exhausted. I don't know about you guys. Congratulations to everybody who has made it here, especially everybody who made it here via way of karaoke last night. Um, I'm very, very proud of you. Very proud of you indeed. Um, it's my absolute pleasure to introduce our closing plenary. We've decided, given that you guys are an adventurous crowd, we decided to do something slightly different to the, the way that we normally do it. So we haven't got a closing keynote for you. Um, haven't got somebody standing up and um, I'm talking about it. What we've done is we've asked these wonderful ladies, who I'm going to shortly introduce to you, to do a horrendous task. And like fools, they agreed to do it. So, so um, their, their lack of thought and, f and foresight is our benefit. Um, they've um, been... Um, their role at the conference has been slightly different to all of you people who've just been relaxing and having a wonderful time. They've been actually tasked with thinking about shifting through filtering all of the kinds of things that have gone on during the conference in order to bring together um, a voice and a view and a take on what, what we've achieved, where, where we are, and to, to have some time reflecting on the conference. So we're hoping this is going to work well. In terms of Alec and I's goals, um, you know, I think we're both feeling very, very positive about where we are and where we've got to. We wanted the conference to be very international. And I think, you know, we've, from the diversity of delegates, the amazing range of stories, case studies, research papers, that have come from around the globe, I think we've certainly achieved that. Yeah, thanks. Thanks. We also really wanted the conference to focus on inclusion and diversity and look seriously at that in terms of our work as a community and in terms of us as a community. And I'm, I'm very, very happy um, with how you've taken that challenge and, and the papers and the work and the thinking and thoughtfulness that have gone into that as well. So thank you again very much for that. I didn't have an end goal about posting shoe pictures on Twitter. Realistically, I should have thought of that and put that in. And I also didn't have an end goal that involved how many different kinds of animals can we have a small Twitter war over. Um, but you, nobody, nobody is going to blame me for not thinking of that one. <laughs> okay. Um, and the other thing, one of the other goals that was really, really important to us was about movement building. And giving you people a platform and a space to talk and connect and meet and think together. And I certainly feel that we've had... Um, a journey together <laughs> over the last couple of days um, and that we as a community have had the opportunity to really get together and really talk to each other, make new friends, um, find out about each other's work as well. So I'm going to hand over to my, uh, uh, my, my great panel here. Um, quick introductions. At the end, we've got uh, Catherine Cronin. She's an educator and researcher at the Centre for Excellence in Learning and Teaching at the National University of Ireland. Sitting in the middle, we've got Marin O'Keefe, and she's a researcher and academic developer at Dublin City University. And on the end here, closest to me, we've got um, your, your Laura Chernovich, who is director of the Centre for Innovation in Learning and Teaching at the University of Cape Town. So I'll hand over now and let them get on with the session. Thank you very much. Actually, we got a mic. <laughs> it was the clicker I wanted, Jodie, actually. <laughs> Thank you. So um, we are going to give um, uh, our opinions and reflections in a few moments. But what we'd like first is a place to gather your opinions and your reflections on OER 17 so far. So I'd like you to get your devices out. I can see lots of phones and perhaps tablets. And if you have access to laptops and 
What I'd like you to do is take part on a Padlet wall, if you've ever heard of that. One of the presentations I was in. So it will look a little like this to start with. Um, it's, a, it's a blank wall and you double tap on it um, and the link is here. And we want, we'd like you to reflect on some questions with the person beside you. So it's a think, pair, share activity. I'd like to, yeah, as soon as you get to the, the link, I suppose, turn around to your nearest neighbor or even a group of people beside you and have a think about these questions for the next five minutes. What is the most unexpected thing you've learned at the conference? The most important or useful thing? And what most important questions or issues are, are you going to take forward? Okay. So five minutes, I'm hoping to hear lots of noise. live as well so much go to that link and the web is on this we need to let them see the link over because they won't get it otherwise yeah Okay. Ah, oh, well, type if you've if you've got something on the end of your fingertips, type it quickly now. I have no idea. I have no idea. Sorry, um, Martin. They want to show the Padlet if possible, and then in a minute after she's finished talking, you need to switch it back. Keep talking, I'd start reading, I'd start doing the things now. Sorry. Oh, I'm on here. Okay, folks, so I'm trying to bring up the, um, the padded walls, we'll actually see that, but I can see lots of activities being really dynamic. And I'm going to read out some of the things. Um, somebody here has just put on the wall about fear. We need to confront this fear of speaking our mind. 
And that resonates with me. Um, you know, how do we get into these situations where we can have voice? Um, would anybody want to say a little more about that? No, not at the moment. Sorry, yeah, I'll just run through these first. Um, how cool Wikipedia... Oh, God, these are moving so fast. An unexpectedly poetic conference with loads of great metaphors aside... Um, considerate advocacy, spoiling the trousers. Fantastic. Yeah, I think so too. How Another thought. How Anglo-centric um, OER is. Um, another one. Keep quiet about the politics. Um, we're novices in some way and can support each other continually in the OER, OEP process, just like any education and learning, I suppose. Great stuff. Diverse voices from Global South and wider UK and North America. Lots of female voices. Political karaoke. Oh, great, we've got them on screen. Political karaoke. I liked this idea about political karaoke during the second keynote. Whoops, they're reading so fast. This is hard to read. <laughs> um, hang in there, be inspired by open. I did most important question. Um, or, you know, I'm going to turn to Laura and Catherine and ask you if anything stood out on the wall there for either of you. I think what we might do is leave the wall there and do our reflections and then maybe come back to that because, um, is that okay? Yeah, because I know you're, okay, that's fine. Well, we'll come back to it then. All right. Okay, so I'll just read out another few here. Useful networking and sharing, and I've certainly felt like that myself. It's my first OER and I've certainly found uh, a tribe of my own within the OER community here in the last two days. Um, where do OEP conversations happen? They happen on collaborating, on creating, adopting OER, where does this happen? In the physical virtual spaces. Okay, and most fun was the Mickey Media Games and I did hear, see some, or see something that on Twitter and I think I missed out on that one. So it looks like a lot of fun. All right, so... Um, so I read one and it said I was made bad. <laughs> I don't know, so if that was like your cry for help, <laughs> come and have a word afterwards, okay? And we'll, we'll sort you out somehow. We'll, we'll make you better in some way. <laughs> oh. oh, no, I, I didn't. I only, I only read it in passing. I'm going to go back and pour over it tonight. Okay, so that's going to stay there, and we've got that resource there. So thank you ever so much for that. I'm going to now ask the um, panel to share their reflections um, in terms of the conference. So I'll hand over to Catherine first, please. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, and thanks so much for the opportunity, Josie and Alec. Uh, we wanted to start, this is on behalf of all of us, just to thank the three amazing keynotes. And um, if you want to express your gratitude as well, please do. Um, it, uh, we, we had a chat before uh, the conference and we realized that even among the three of us we could experience less than half the conference only because it's been such an amazingly rich program but we all really enjoyed the keynotes and in particular we gathered after Diana's keynote yesterday where's Diana okay and felt that she really put the gauntlet down to us and we thought how will we be able to incorporate artistic expression in our um, in our final comments and we decided that we would just very quickly choose two examples of what we saw as deep artistic community expressions, um, one from Ireland, one from South Africa. So does anyone know what this logo is? Repeal the Eighth Amendment. OK. Um, for those of you who don't, uh, Ireland has uh, the, an Eighth Amendment in the Constitution, which equates the life of a pregnant woman with the life of the unborn. So abortion is illegal in Ireland. And several women travel over every day from Ireland to the UK and to other places um, in order to um, get abortions. Now, international human rights organizations from the, human court of, the European Court of Human Rights to Amnesty International have criticized Ireland and challenged them on this. Um, and there's a growing movement called the Repeal the Eighth Movement. You can see um, the hashtag there, um, which is trying to, um, to, to repeal the Eighth Amendment. So there was a mural that appeared. I shared some murals last year uh, when I was at OER 16. This was a mural on the Project Art Center in Dublin. There have been dozens of murals on this wall, but this mural was objected to almost as soon as it went up by Mazer, a graffiti artist. And challenge was made to the Dublin City Council, and the mural had to be uh, removed. So over the course of a couple of days, that mural was wiped out. But the artistic and resistant 
expression of women in Dublin to this was enormous. So one of the things that happened was that women gathered in front of the wall and painted themselves blue. Um, and that kind of act of erasure was turned into a, a, a very powerful act of resistance. And there were, that woman was holding up a repeal donut, there was repeal clothing, there's repeal light installations and so on. And um, hopefully we'll get to share this with Diana as well, because I think it really is in the vein of um, what she was talking about. Um, in terms of the conference, the only Padlet note that I could read before they all went whizzing by was, well, now we've talked the talk and we have to walk the walk. I don't know who said that, but that's kind of where I'm feeling at the moment, um, at the end of the two days. The same experience can be interpreted so differently by different people, and that was brought home to me. You know, there was a question in one of the workshops I was in yesterday saying, we're talking about open in education, but we're not talking about beyond education. And many other discussions I was in say, you know, we're talking about changing society here. We all just see education as being uh, a very powerful way of doing that. Um, and Lucy um, reinforced that this morning. Um, another comment that I heard was someone who said, oh, I now understand that critical means critical discourse and critical social theory. I thought it meant being critical of. Um, so I think we really need to be careful when we talk about being um, the importance of critical discourse, that it doesn't mean being antagonistic, um, as some people said today, that it can come from a place of care, as Kate Bowles says so beautifully. Um, this body of work in critical social theory um, is we can draw on to a much greater extent than we have. This is my third OER conference. Uh, the first one was OER 15, and there was a small strand of work, I would say, at that conference um, that could be called critical. Last year, that was a bit larger, and this year, it's just exploded. And I think these are the conversations that we need to have. Open can improve access and equity, as so many of the presentations here have shown, but it can also exacerbate inequality, as we know. Openness is always negotiated on an individual basis. So open educational practices, I found in my own work, um, is always personal, it's always contextual, and it's always continuously negotiated. So we can be advocates for openness in a societal and institutional level, but still be very cognizant of the risks that we may be asking people to take, staff, students, whoever, um, when we're advocating for openness. And finally, um, just I want to counterpose my experience here at OER 17 with my recent experience at OE Global and as was mentioned also in the Padlet Wall, I think we really need to challenge our northern-centered epistemology. And I think that was done to a great extent here at the conference. We could do it more. The work of Wikimedia globally is hugely important in that respect. Um, but we as researchers in the global north, whether that means North America, uh, UK, uh, Europe, wh whatever that means for you, we have a collective responsibility to deepen our awareness of work done on a more global level in open education. It is there. That's all to start with. Thank you. So Diana had an influence on us. And um, I'd like to start by showing you this um, image of performance art, which happened in 2015 at the University of Cape Town when student protests led to the removal of the Rhodes statue, which had always stood at the front of the campus. And during this event, a, an art student, in fact, uh, not a drama student, uh, Setembele M. Cezani, spent four hours dressed up as a Zimbabwe bird, flapping these incredibly heavy wings um, as a protest to the fact that Rhodes had gone to Great Zimbabwe, which, as you know, is of enormous historical importance, and stolen the sculpture of the Zimbabwe bird, which is still in his um, official residence. And it, it, to me, it speaks to the conference in the sense of the kinds of issues around protest and decolonialism de and um, the geopolitics of knowledge and the, the issues of, of southern epistemologies that Catherine has referred to, I really think emerged at this conference. So I really think kudos to the organizers because this was a very explicit conference in terms of its themes. Most of the time conferences have themes and they are, they're indicative, they're tokens. Um, but I think in this particular case, when I was looking through my notes of the conference, 
the sessions I went to, and of course I went to a sixth of the conference, the issues of criticality, um, of coloniality, of androcentrism, um, of democracy, questions of freedom and openness that have been discussed in, in several sessions. The um, focus on development, so the development goals at an open education conference, which have come up in at least three places, I think that that's been uh, uh, really exciting. It really hasn't been on the edge. It's been pretty central to the conference. So that's been really exciting. The one thing that I would like to put out as a challenge to the community is that I think we've been all quite quick to talk about uh, the commons. And I feel like it's a bit of a throwaway line. And I would like to see the open education community explore the notion of the commons in much more detail. Because I don't think that the commons, as it's uh, spoken about originally in nature, is the same as the digital commons. And I think it's actually quite a complex notion. And it's quite an easy thing for us to suggest as an alternative imaginary. So that's, that, that's a, perhaps a gauntlet that I'm um, throwing down. And then another one that I'm throwing down, which I think is much more contentious, but I think it's the role of the, the panelists to be contentious. Um, I've been a little bit concerned during this conference at the easy homogenizing of all references to the market. The market, commerce, um, neoliberalism, all these bad, terrible things that we all object to. And of course, this is not a pro-market statement. But I think we also need to develop a more nuanced engagement with the hybrid economy that higher education actually is. And there's a danger that we seem to be suggesting that the state should take over education and the state, which, I mean, I, I'm not sure that is, well, I would be not, I wouldn't be promoting that. So I think um, something else I'd like to see is a more robust engagement with different types of models, that terrible word business models, which everyone is so averse to, but I think we need to be really exploring. And I think it's in our own interests, because while we're sitting about saying this is all very terrible, the market's doing really, really well in taking over the world, and I think we need to be engaging in a much more nuanced and complex way with the hybrid economy of provision that we are part of. I'll stop with that. Okay, thank you, Catherine and Laura. Um, I guess we all come into conferences, into situations and contexts um, as different people with different experiences and in different positions in institutions, in society, in the world. Um, and I feel in entering into OER um, 17 and my first OER conference that I am a relatively new person into this network. Um, also within my working context, I've worked in several different universities um, and each I, because of short term contracts, and I'm sure many people have been affected by, by those kind of things. So. Um, I, yeah, I, I suppose I'm talking about the issues of power and how uh, my experience have influenced my thinking around the conference teams. Um, so as a person, I perceive myself with, with low power, but what has res resonated with me at the conference is opening up conversations about influence, listening to people, how they have been able to influence, how they talk to people, let's say, in a strategic way, but also in a, a ground up way, talking to, um, other champions of learning and teaching or open education, finding um, the people who have similar or maybe dissimilar mindsets about open education and finding those. And I think that that's a process. Um, it's about uh, forming relationships with people. Um, and I look forward to being involved more in the OER community and, and building more relationships like that. And hopefully in, in my own future work in institutions, I will have um, better and more strategies um, to make influence myself, to uh, uh, talk about e-learning perhaps in a different way, to talk about academic development, which is my own area in a better way, and influence things that I think would be worthwhile following on institutional strategies. Um, yeah, this image, I suppose, sums up 
was um, mentioned, I think it's from Brian Math, as Catherine was saying, and while Diana yesterday was using it in terms of finding the location, um, I thought it was very useful that she, she mentioned about collaborative efforts um, and as an artist, um, working with somebody to find the location where art could be displayed. For myself, I feel that um, I haven't known where that location is, but I'm hoping that these collaborations that, you know, that I'll be able to talk to people and find those locations. So that's why that image resonates with me. I think that's about all for me for the moment. Yeah. So we've got a little bit of time now for you um, as delegates and as the community to actually either ask questions of the panellists who have been kind of thinking about the higher level of the conference or, as has proved very popular in this conference, for you to share your reflections with us in this session. <laughs> but you, and you're welcome to do that briefly. We, we, we welcome hearing that as well. Okay. Uh, thank you very much for the really great um, everyone reflections. Um, I have a question actually now, not a comment. Laura, you were talking about the the models, and I'm quite, I would say, ignorant um, and and just didn't get really what you're talking about. Although I think I have an, a general idea, and it seems important to take that into account. Could you? extend on that idea so I could then know better what to do next in a way. Thank you. I was, I was referring to the way that um, teaching and learning provision is unbundling in higher education. And that's leading to new forms of relationships with different partners and to the a kind of fragmentation where it's now possible for teaching content, assessment, support, um, uh, online exams, whatever, could be undertaken by different partners in different configurations. And I think that the private sector is taking advantage of exploring this in really interesting ways, driven very often by profit motives, although one must be careful not to conflate non-profits with profit um, organizations. Um, but I'm concerned that the open education movement's not doing enough to explore new models um, afforded by the new technologies. So we can all think of a handful of models, but I'm worried that uh, there are incredible opportunities of new forms of provision that are, that are afforded by the technologies, that are possible that we're not spending enough time um, developing for different ends. So that was, that's what I was referring to. Thank you. Hear me? Yeah. Yes, yeah. okay, fab. Um, first of all, I'd like to say it's been a really fabulous two days. I think I'll probably speak for everybody when I say I'm just buzzing with ideas. Um, the, the past few days really made me feel that I found my tribe and you know we all share very similar values and and um, we're open to learning we're open is is not just a you know a concept it's actually what we do and how we engage with each other and um, and that's so fabulous that I I'm reluctant to introduce a negative note but it's been niggling at the back of my mind and I'm going to try and articulate it and that's um, you know, we, we've talked in, in a lot of the sessions about the forces of, are we calling it Trexit now? Um, and that's been such a dominating force over the past year or so um, that seemed to come almost from nowhere. And I'm just conscious that we're in danger of creating a kind of echo chamber because we have these shared values and shared approaches um, that actually the open education model can be used by anybody. So um, OER 18 might have people who are interested in developing OERs to educate people about the dangers of immigration or you know, things that we would consider 
not to be such open messages and not shine with their values. And I'm just wondering, I've seen so many relatively open spaces um, being colonized by more toxic people and more toxic messages. And I'm wondering, as an open community, um, is that something we should be conscious of? Okay, thank you so much. I'm sure that um, Myrna and Laura might have things to say as well. This um, is one of the things that's troubled me as well, is that being in this community can feel like a warm bath sometimes, and that we can fool ourselves into thinking that you know, open educators are people who are committed to democratic practices and so on. And certainly one of the things I found in my own research is that some people get involved in open education for purely structural reasons. You know, they may end up in a situation where they have to use open practices, they don't want to, um, and many, many other reasons. So I think you're right to crack that open and, and be careful about the assumptions that we make. Um, I've been enthused at the conference about the number of people who've been talking about things outside of higher education. So the Wikimedia work, the work that's done in the glam sector, the work that's being done in schools, I'm thinking of Sarah Brune here, um, the, um, the liaisons that are going on between higher education and the community, and I think we need to do much, much more of that because we are, we are in echo chambers. And there's a poverty of language sometime around openness when we all think it means the same thing and we have to crack open those terms. Even the question Caroline just asked about what do you mean by models? So, um, so yeah, I, I mean, I suppose I can only agree with you and think that we need to do more to move outside of our kind of comfort zones uh, in terms of language and in terms of how and where we act and do our work. I don't know if that's helpful, but I hear you. We got any more questions or comments at this point? Okay, so what we're going to do now then is move on to our next activity. You don't get to rest. You could have had a rest if one of you wanted to ask a question. But because none of you did, you've all got to work now. <laughs> okay, I should have probably said that before, but um, it's, the thing is, it's so enjoyable it won't even seem like an, any effort at all. Yes. Okay, so I'll pass you over for the next activity. All we want to do now is, is uh, close, for the, just the purposes of this conference, a beautiful circle that was started by Maha's keynote yesterday morning where she talked about intentionality and that the gift metaphor can be problematic, but the only way we know if that's problematic is if we're very clear about our intentions and, and bring those to the light and, and open them for discussion and examination. So we just wanted to ask you all, uh, before you hit the road, to share. Uh, you can do it with your partner as well, but um, if you could tweet it if you're on Twitter, use the OER17 hashtag and the hashtag I will, just to share an intention that you have, or more than one. And so as not to um, exclude the people who aren't on Twitter, we've also set up a Google Doc um, and the link is there. So just to, to reflect on something that you intend to do or intend to take forward from the conference, and then we'll wrap this up. Thank you. have come up. I know that, that always biscuits always come up, but um, if we can think about um, the things that we're going to actually take forward from the conference and the things that we um, either came with in terms of our commitments and have been strengthened by the things at the conference or things that actually we want to try and explore, the new directions that we want to take that have been inspired by things that we've um, learnt at the conference and people that we've met and spoken to at the conference as well.
Hi, um, I'm just looking at the I will intentions there, and I see one there, um, I will going to post in SIG blog, even if it's crap, and I'm saying, uh, Catherine said in a, in a session yesterday about Wikipedia, I think, go do it. And for myself who, um, I've had a blog, let's say for the last five or six years, but I've only, I think, been finding my voice in the, in the last year on it, and I wish that I had put myself out there a little more. It is a bit of a reach into that space. It does feel vulnerable, but it is worthwhile because then other people know who you are, know what your interests are, and those people um, have reached into my space then and give me what Bonnie Stewart calls uh, care and support, um, especially when I was on my um, doing my doctorate um, last year. So, yeah, blog, do that blog, whoever um, has posted that. Marion, I think. So, thank you. I will raise some hell. <laughs> Lorna's going to find out how long a goat lives. <laughs> I know we're all desperate to find out. And I will storify these I will tweets to share. Okay, and somebody else is going to resurrect their Wikimedia account and use it. And Marion Deepwell has said about policy, work on policy and enable more practice in my organization. And I was at Alex's talk earlier on where he was talking about policy being that dark matter. Um, and I was, I just was trying to articulate something about like policy. You know, I really feel that it is beyond me, that it is far away from me, from where I sit within the context of everything. Um, but it is something that um, policy can be powerful um, and it's useful to put ourselves in the position where we can take part in conversations that influence strategy and policy. Um, so yeah, I'm going to try and do that in my next, in, I suppose my work workplace or context, be in those conversations that influence policy. Checking the Google, and we have a Google Doc as well, so I'm just going to check that. I will read. Open the philosophy and practices that are revolutionizing education and science by Rajiv. And talk to the teachers at my institution about OER. Awareness stimulates usage of OER. And that's it, and that's something else that came across to me about like how to influence. It's awareness raising, and awareness raising in a number of different contexts and, and locations. Anybody? Open Knowledge Education Working Group say, we will keep promoting, supporting and advocating open education, enabling spaces for participation, collaboration and dialogue. Maybe in the spirit of karaoke, we should all stand up and sing, We Will Survive. <laughs> that might be an I will too far. <laughs> I think there's going to be an announcement about the OER 18 chairs. Is that right? Does that happen today? Or? Okay, yeah, but what, all I'm saying is whoever those people are, we don't know who they are yet. I don't know who they are, but there's a lot of love for OER 18 in the stream. And some of them say that they're coming, lots of people saying they're coming, and they're going to bring three more people in addition to themselves. So, very exciting. Yeah, that's going to be announced very shortly. You're obviously going to be the first people to know who those new chairs are going to be, what the possible topic might be. Uh, we'll be doing that. We'll be announcing that very soon. Before we do that, though, um, we're going to. Did you want to do any more of the tweets at the moment, or can we? Okay. So we're going to hand back over for some final words um, from our panelists. Okay. Um, I hardly know what to say. I'll just be really brief. I think one thing that I wanted to say before that I didn't say was um, I would like to encourage 
more research that is qualitative, interpretive, dialogic, and critical. Because some of the most wonderful work that um, I heard and saw in the last two days was based on that kind of research. And it helps us to really combat the facile assumptions that are often made by um, policymakers um, in different positions who make, who make um, as I said, facile assumptions about the digital and about open. So that's my challenge or encouragement. Yeah, and to link in with that, I sp and I'll mention my research that it was qualitative and about the real experiences of people who um, were trying to use Twitter to put voice online and that there was real barriers and inhibitors in, a, in an effective and in a social way. Um, and I see a lot of people tweeting here said, I am going to blog, I am going to reach out. I always, I always had that intention. But for certain reasons of, um, I suppose, confidence, my own vulnerability and the vulnerability of being in precarious work positions as well, I felt that they were a real barrier. So um, for those people who are going to blog, I'm not sure if you'll come across, if you'll feel in those same ways, but this is a great network. And I'm sh if you can find a peer to review your post, if you need that kind of help, and that's what I wish that I had, had actually, was you know somebody else to review something that I, if I was going to express voice. Um, so ask somebody to review it maybe, and if, you, if you like, if you need to, um, reach out and ask any of us here um, about that or for help. Yeah, one of the, the, the main, I had lots of notes on this conference, and one of the things that I didn't say earlier was that it was really lovely to see how theorized so much of the work has been. And I know many people struggle over this, how do I be an advocate and a practitioner and a professional and a scholar? Well, actually people are doing it. And so I think let's stop stressing about that and just, just do it. Just keep doing it. Okay, so thank you very much. Let's have a round of applause for our panel. Yeah, see you um, next year. There we are, 18. <laughs> I'll, I'll drop you an email. <laughs> okay, so um, this is the part of the day when um, I feel a little bit sad. Alec has a little tear come to his eye um, because it's the time when we actually have to relinquish our mighty power as co-chairs um, and pass on our beautiful OER tiaras to the next people that are coming. But before we're going to do that, we're going to say some thank yous to people. So first of all, we want to say thank you, obviously, to everyone who made this event happen. But huge, huge thanks to the conference committee who did loads and loads of hard work, made sure everything um, went like clockwork. And I think we can all agree, picked an amazing selection of papers for us all to enjoy. So, I mean, thank you ever so much for the quality um, of work. On the other side of that, thank you very much to everybody who submitted um, that work and everybody who came along and actually spoke, delivered workshops um, and gave speeches for us. We really, really, really appreciate that very much. The other people that we need to thank are obviously our sponsors, um, uh, who we're very, very grateful to um, for supporting the event and showing that they're standing with us in terms of what we want to achieve and the, and the things that we wanted to uh, um, work through at this conference. So thank you very, very much to Reclaim Hosting and to Spark um, for being there for us. We'll see you next year. Um, and we also have got four people that we want to specifically thank who have been involved um, in promoting and sharing and um, talking about the conference on social media. So can I ask Joe, Rebecca, Jeffrey, and Sinead to come up and can we give them a round of applause as well please? <laughs>
Um, we also want to thank um, the chairs of the sessions. That's a very small but important role uh, that makes things work um, fluidly. And I also wanted to thank, but I'm sure you agree, because this is out of the uh, program, people who do the virtually connecting work. You know, it's a very important bridge that bridges the real with the virtual, or rather the real with the real. Uh, I find that it, really this is a crucial element. So um, thank you to you. And finally, last but not least, we want to thank Marin uh, and Martin and the whole um, alt um, team that worked with us, and Krista, and I'm forgetting to other people, I'm sorry. Okay. But uh, I must say as a chair, this has been just fabulously nice work working with you because it was all so well organized and um, professional and amazing. So thank you very much. Well, thank you. On behalf of um, the, the whole team that works with me and Aldo, all five of us, we're delighted that we've been able to be part of this and support this community. Um, it is my honor on behalf of all of us here to thank two more people who for the last 12 months have worked tirelessly to pull this event together and I think whose vision and exemplary leadership for this conference has really helped make this a very standout event. The shoes from previous co-chairs of the OER conferences are very big and I have to say they are getting bigger every year. <laughs> So if you'd like to put your hands together one more time for Alec and Josie. <laughs> but now, saying that the shoes are getting bigger every year, so there's no pressure. We're coming to that part of the afternoon where we're looking ahead at next year and seeing what we can do to take action, what the I wills will turn into in the next 12 months. Because we're now ready to announce OER 18. And for that, we have a very special guest who I'm now going to ask to come up and join me on stage. She's very bravely representing the conference next year on her own, so please give her a very warm welcome, Vivian Rolf. <laughs> I'm not prepared, I really am. This is just so much too much, and who said stepping outside of comfort zones, Catherine, because, you know, you are a community that has had such an impact on me for way over 10 years now, uh, through my work, through my, my research, and uh, it is utterly overwhelming to be studier. Um, Essex girl done good. But anyway, I'm so, well, you wouldn't think so. Sorry about the shoes, but I'm sure my co-chair, who you'll meet in a minute, will look stunning in some some heels um, and we're going to keep the theme of what we've started this year really I think you know there has been such a leap forward and there's so much vibrancy in the room we're going to keep the themes around diversity we're going to keep the themes around engaging with our communities um, but I think the people that we perhaps haven't heard so much about in the conference um, in the last few days has been our learners and our extended communities back in our organizations. So very much the theme of next year will be uh, as open education has kind of hit its terrible teens, you know, we're sem 17 years down the line now in the UK um, from some of those early starts, you know, what has been the impact on our learners and how have they benefited from engaging in open practices and all the cool things that you're doing with people back in your organization. So it's all about the student and the learner next year. So I hope you approve of that. Um, so I'm not going to do this on my own, obviously. Um, that's a very uh, um, difficult job and such a tough act to follow with these two guys. So we, my coach, unfortunately, is now sailing around the Mediterranean on his yacht as we speak. But he's moored up in Barcelona and he's left um, a video message with Martin Hawksey. I think Martin's going to play some of this, if that's okay. I might do. Carry, okay, in line. 
<laughs> Absolutely, Martin, yeah. So, as we said, everything needs to be gold, okay? We need gold chairs, uh, we need gold curtains. Uh, do you think we can get some uh, gold shoes for Sheila McNeil? That would work, yeah. And, yeah, I mean, obviously, of course, business class. Yeah, yeah, definitely, okay. Hi, I'm David Cunnan. You called me co-chairing a conference. Hi, I'd like to welcome you all to the idea of OER18. There's been a, a number of promises made about open education, and what it can do for the world, what it can do for learning. OER18 is a conference where we find out how well we've done and what work we still need to do. I'm really sorry I can't be there with you at OER17. But I am so looking forward to being there at the conference in April 2018, OER 18. So I don't know what this talk about goats is. It's all about the dogs, right? I did ask Spike to co-chair, but I thought, you know, themes around... Uh, sort of sticks and uh, sofa cushions just would just wouldn't hack it. So, uh, but anyway, we really look forward to working with all of you. Um, and thank you to those of you that have already volunteered to be on the committee for next time. Uh, we look forward to working with Yoran. Um, I know he's really keen. So uh, there we go. Good to go. See you on the ice. So there's no time like the present time to turn your I will intention to a sign up for volunteering for next year. If you go and go to the conference website, you can now sign up and become part of our community for the next 12 months. It has been a huge privilege to share the last two days with you and we are finishing five minutes early. <laughs> so um, please do make sure you have all your belongings, have a safe journey home and help us spread our message about the importance of openness in education and beyond across the globe. Thank you very much. Wow.